Hello, good morning everyone. Uh, thank you for being here and excited to start this panel. Uh, so first of all, we would like to start with a short introduction um, about each of the speaker and then on myself as well. So let's start off with Ishan. Sure, hi everyone. Uh, thank you for coming. My name is Ishan. Uh, I was actually born and raised here in Bangkok, but now I'm currently based in London. Um, after a career in traditional finance, um, across asset management, and most recently at Citadel before this, I'm a partner at Ethereum Ventures. Ethereum Ventures is the original team that founded the VC arm of Consensus back in the day. We spun out and raised independent funds, and the purpose of the organization is to provide seed and pre-seed capital to companies building anything related to crypto and blockchain. We're globally distributed, and the way we invest is to sort of be active investors in that we're really hands-on with the companies we work with. So whether it's hiring, plugging them into clients, plugging them into proper infrastructure, uh, teams and services, um, we help them go to market and help them scale up into the organizations they eventually go on to become. Um, we mostly invested uh, in infrastructure in our first fund and now in the process of um, raising the second fund. Some familiar, some familiar names to you guys might be Flashbox, Alluvio, Eigenlayer, Alio, Aztec, and the like. Awesome. Hey everybody, uh, my name is Alluvio, I run Star Ventures. Um, it's a VC fund based out of Dubai. I myself have um, half Italian, half Swiss, also come from a traditional Web2 world, and uh, been in crypto since 2012. In and out, uh, ups and downs, the usual stuff. But um, yeah, very excited to be in the space and happy to be in Bangkok. Thank you. Um, thank you, Isha and Daniela. Uh, a bit about myself I'm Surada I'm from KXBC. Um, we're a $100 million fund investing in Web3 AI deep tech. And at the moment, we're um, expanding and we're positioning ourselves as the, the gateway to Southeast Asia. And we do welcome our partners. We're stage agnostic, and um, yeah, like it's great to meet everyone. Um, so first of all, um, we'll start off the topic with a broader picture um, of the transition from the fringe to mainstream and the insights from investors and the future of digital assets. So start off, um, let's ask you, Ishan, first on how have you observed the perception of digital assets changing among investors over the past few years? Um, I think, in general, the trend is up and to the right, right, minus the fluctuations in between that are normal of, and characteristic of, of every market. So in general, I think investors are coming around to the idea of this asset class of digital assets, like that's a very obvious statement. What's interesting and what we're seeing a lot now, um, even in the very, very early stage rounds, is we're starting to partner up and team up with the likes of like venture arms from Thai banks, from the likes of Fidelity, um, the likes of Van Eck. So a lot more mainstream traditional finance companies entering the, entering the realm and entering the arena, which is great because they write pieces about helping other investors educate themselves on what this sector is all about. So I would say their perception has gone through a lot of volatility, but there's a lot to be interested and excited about, um, especially now with the floodgates of the ETFs coming and a lot more access that traditional finance is beginning to get to the space. Um, there's, the perception is, is, at, is, is trending correctly, but still is at a low point, right? So there's a lot more to, to do from here for sure. Daniel as well. Yeah, I mean, just wanting to add which excites me is the, the type of talent that is entering the space. Uh, you see people from traditional banking and just like really like new, 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 new sets of talents coming into the space very regularly. And I think that's why what's making the, in the industry more exciting. And um, I do think we are still early in, in really, you know, building up this digital asset world that we are kind of like uh, building together. Um, besides that, I think what's what's also exciting is to see kind of a nascent, uh, um, you know, ecosystems and countries coming into blockchain. Like I myself, I'm from Switzerland. Uh, in Switzerland, you know, there is a perception that, that blockchain is a pretty big thing. We have Zoo, we have Ethereum, who's actually you know, based in Switzerland. How, and Switzerland is also a financial hub in the world. But when it comes to the perception of people in Switzerland of blockchain, 
it's you know not very popular, right? So I do think there's still a big opportunity for growth. Uh, and then if you know, I'm also half Italian in Italy, nobody knows what blockchain is, right? So <laughs> my point is um, we're still early, and uh, I think we just need uh, you know more and more talent uh, coming into the space, and that's what's, what's going to make everything you know bigger and, and more interesting. It's great to hear like international perspective. Um, coming over because I'm based in Bangkok, so it's great to hear um, like perspective on different parts of the world. Um, so diving down deeper, like what factors do you believe are driving the transition of digital assets from the fringe to mainstream investment portfolios? That's a good question. Um, so one, I think, you know, price drives narrative a lot of the time. So when the prices of these assets go up, traditional money managers are forced to ask the question or answer the question to their clients of like, why is this not in our portfolio? Should we think about this in our portfolio? Can we own this? What does it mean to own this? So in a way, like it's a self-perpetuating feedback loop that occurs. Um, that's one. Two, I think what's, what's really interesting about the space and what, what Bitcoin and Ethereum, at least where the traditional money can actually flow at this point in time, what they stand for is really a new way for the world to underpin a trust system. <clears throat> Excuse me. And as with you know the, the mass panics and, and strange situations that have occurred over the last three years, starting from COVID and so on, this this perception of government is is taking a weird shift in our minds. So this idea of a new trust system is interesting. How is it that we've come up, you know, we've come to create this in just five, six years? This idea has become proliferated. The ethos and philosophy of what decentralized ledgers stand for has become interesting to the human mind now. And as a result, people that are allocating capital are actually diving in and learning and thinking about this. So I think that's the second factor. The third factor is that I think it's a little bit of a game theoretical situation where in the beginning, most governments didn't you know, understand or want anything to do with this, looked at this with, in my opinion, over-indexed cautiousness. But slowly, one by one, you know, some small governments started to get interested. And as a result, other governments are forced to look at it. Now we've seen you know, all these interesting, happen interesting happenings occur with the likes of Hong Kong, Dubai, um, really getting involved in the Middle East, getting involved in a massive way here. So I think that's, the, that's, that's another reason as well. Like when governments are adopting it here, they're sort of forced to in what is actually like a global playing sphere. Um, there are laggards with the, with the regulatory situation, as you all know, with like such as the US, but when that clears, then, then sort of, I think the fog will become, will sort of clear and we'll really see what's happening underneath, which from my point of view is that there's a lot more traditional companies involved in the blockchain space than we actually think. Um, and when the time is right, they can sort of reveal what they've been working on. Yeah, so um, I, I think in general it depends like which stakeholder of the ecosystem we're looking at. If we're looking at people, um, why are people interested in, in blockchain besides you know the technical aspect? It's it's financial freedom. I think every you know the world is becoming more global. People are more empowered, and um, you know money is empowerment, and people want to feel more free and want to have you know also you know more freedom in terms of you know what they can do with the assets they own. So I think. Um, it's been like a natural shift. Everything is digital. Why should money not be digital? That's kind of a, a usual question. And um, I think if you look at kind of investors, you can see, you know, what happened like in the dot-com world. Um, I do think uh, investors don't want to miss out uh, on, you know, the new dot-com. And I think, um, you know, th there is a perception that the blockchain world is a new dot-com uh, era. And I think with AI coming into the picture soon, or it's already here, but um, you know that's another kind of wave where, where investors really have to stop paying attention. So, if people educate themselves before governments, you know that's that's actually a, you know an interesting factor. So, governments, as um, you know, Nishat said, we have they have to also um, you know force themselves to educate themselves. And, and there is regions in the world which have done a better job than others at, at moving forward. But um, yeah, I still I think we're early, and it's it's good to see this development. Both of you touched on really good points that there are new players 
getting into the space, especially like governments, um, banking um, companies, tech companies, um, and especially like new institutional players are getting into the space as well. So that's one asked, like uh, one aspect I would ask in a leading question is that, in your opinion, what key developments or events have contributed to the increase acceptance of digital assets by institutional investors? Um, institutional investors. To be very honest, I think from what, from, from what we see on the ground, the institutions are still only willing to dip their toes maximum into Bitcoin and perhaps start thinking about Ethereum. The way they look at Ethereum is more of a tech company, more of like a, a tech stock, if you will. You know, can this thing actually gain users and adoption and can smart contracts eat the world? Um, Bitcoin is still the main foray that, that businesses are willing to even think about in terms of decentralized ledger technology. In terms of the main events of what sort of led up to here, outside of the institutional world, I think they're, I don't want to take anything away from the innovation in the space. So going back to DeFi summer, like it was, you know, an era of really interesting speculation, but what really kicked that off was the invention, right, of, of an, an automated market maker. For the first time in the world now, instead of trading through a broker, you could trade through funds that are latent on some sort of smart contract. And that kicked off this new innovation of like, oh wow, this is, this is something new, let me, let me play around with this toy. Then came along NFTs on the concept of digital asset ownership, and people started playing around with that toy. So I, I think every time we innovate in the space, which has been, which has been a breakneck pace, um, you know, we're moving on to things now like zero knowledge and fully homomorphic encryption, which is truly fascinating with what they enable. Every time an, a new key innovation has sort of entered the arena, um, more people want to play with that. And then that experimentation leads to adoption, which leads to price, which leads to narrative, and then finally to education. So that's, that's where I think like this all bubbles up from. Institutions still looking top down, that don't have the time or the resources or the know-how to do the bottom up as yet, are still very much on the, well, is Bitcoin digital gold? You know, is this more portable money that governments can't take away from this stage of, of where we are? So that, that's what's led up to now. I think the ETFs are gonna be a very big deal for access for people to to enter the space, and then after that, sort of, let's talk about enterprise blockchains then, what that means, and then let's, after that, talk about perhaps the idea of CBDCs. I think that's sort of, in my head, the way this goes. Right, so, so being based in Dubai, uh, for me, it's, it's kind of hard not to ignore and, and see what's been happening in Dubai. We have a number of like, uh, financial infrastructures that have just really boosted the ecosystem. We have the VARA license in Dubai, we have ADGM in, in Abu Dhabi. And um, what I've noticed, and, and, and I think would be great to see in other ecosystems, is actually the government getting involved and invested in infrastructure uh, in exchanges. So recently there was a, um, a pretty big deal that happened in Abu Dhabi. There was an exchange called M2 that actually uh, not only got the license, but was also um, you know, went public uh, on the stock exchange in, in, in Abu Dhabi. And that just provides a lot of awareness, right? So people always are afraid of, um, you know, like of course holding their assets. But once you, you're in a country and you know the government is backing an exchange, that that makes you feel more comfortable, right? So I think exchanges are still such an important part of the ecosystem and what you know brings people kind of peace of mind. Um, and um, yeah, I mean, I would like to see other countries kind of following following that that uh, footsteps. So you, you both touched upon like the government involvement and also trends like Bitcoin ETF that clearly was one of the key catalysts that affect the price movement in the market lately. So moving on to the next topic to expand more on this point is re redefining the global VC trends for the year 2024, which can expand on the points that you both touched on earlier. So as we look ahead to 2024, how do you foresee global VC trends evolving particularly in relation to digital assets? And are there any particular shifts in the investment strategies? I think just tracing back and level setting where, you know, what, what has happened, um, there's always something that's hot in VC. And it's, it's very hard to ignore this um, because valuations do 
trade with the trend. Um, so if you want to outperform as a venture capitalist, you need to be able to catch that trend really, really early, right? Because the companies that are in the trend are the ones that get fundraising and the best opportunity to bring their product to the world. Um, level setting, in 2021, the, the best thing to sort of do at the time in terms of market consensus was to pile money into DeFi and NFTs. And for me personally, like an investment ethos is to always do what the crowd is not doing. But anyways, that was the consensus. And now I think infrastructure is the consensus. So in, in, in that infrastructure investments now are being like really fully valued and let's not even talk about AI. Um, but what's next? I think what's next is we are running out of excuses now as an industry to not be able to put consumer apps, or let's say apps that are powered by blockchain, that put the blockchain and the ugly aspects of it in the back of the actual app and put the utility and the use case in the front. And what I mean by running out of excuses is that we're after Ethereum's protodex sharding or scaling upgrade that's coming up later this year, and maybe if not pushed to, push to Q1, you know, L2 gas fees are gonna be extremely cheap, right? So in a way, we've sort of figured out scaling to this point now where we should be able to build these things where we can have impressions that are blockchain powered on Ethereum, but be really, really cheap. So we should be able to enable really cool use cases and play with digital, the digital realm in a way that we haven't played before. So now that we're there, I'm, I'm excited to see what can we put in the hands of people that's sort of beyond speculation. Speculation is great, don't get me wrong. Love that stuff, but you know, can we see a group of high school girls using something that's blockchain powered? It hasn't happened yet, we'll see. So that's sort of where I think this is going in the very immediate term, something that's consumer based. After that, I think it's gonna be something that's sort of enterprise based. Another trend that I want to talk about outside of like sectors and where the money is flowing from a sector basis is that VCs have in their mind all the recent trauma from the bear market. So they very much care at this point, you know, can your company earn revenue? Can it earn cash? And how are you going to get there? That's the second point I want to make. And then the third point I think is given the amount of talent coming to the space and and to your point, there should be a lot more, but the competition is, is heavy, right? At least around getting the current blockchain users. If more, more people adopt blockchain, that's great. There's enough pie for everyone. But with that, the idea is, can, can we get to a world where the, the teams that are building are doing something unique to bring people onto the blockchain? Do you have a unique distribution strategy? Do you have a unique go-to-market strategy that is beyond targeting the same 3,000 traders on Ethereum? That, that I think, is, is what real VCs are looking for on a day-to-day -day basis on the ground and what's really going to catch fire in the next year or two. Um, something that uh, you mentioned, Vishan, which I, I, I totally agree with, is that um, in a way that we don't have any, any excuses anymore. Right, like um, every every kind of uh, season, every trend. Um, I think investors and also people in crypto have high expectations of what's next. We're waiting for the next super app. We're waiting for adoption. And I think at this point, with also the layer two ecosystem becoming larger, we've noticed that actually users care more about um, you know transaction cost and transaction speed. And transaction costs aren't um, you know as high anymore in that sense. And I think um, if we look at kind of what's going to bring, at least from our perspective, a lot of new users into the space and what's getting like investors also excited is the gaming space. So we're, we're heavily invested in, in the gaming ecosystem. It's a huge, you know, trillion dollar industry. And, um, you know, if we have such uh, big industries like being um, clearly leveraging blockchain technology and also putting, as you said, the, the ugly side behind so that people don't even know they're using blockchain, I think that's really when we're going to have like, um, you know, a new wave of, of people using this technology without knowing it. Like, if you ask people today, like, um, you know, they're using Google, do they really understand HTTPS? Probably not. Most people don't. I don't really either, right? So that's what kind of we're waiting for for the blockchain. People have to be using apps on a daily basis, have to kind of like um, enjoy and benefit from these applications without knowing that they're powered by the blockchain. So I think VCs generally, um, you know, in Web2, uh, it's too late to ignore the blockchain industry. So some like it, some don't, but nobody's ignoring it. And I think that's very important. 
One, one thing I want to add, actually, you know, given you're sort of situated in Dubai, I was just there a few weeks ago for the, the Telegram conference with Ton, and I thought that was fascinating. So that's a great example of, of what he's talking about as well, which is like putting the blockchain at the back and then enabling really cool things on top of it. So I would encourage you guys to look at what Telegram is doing and their integration with the Ton blockchain. So if you, if you go to your settings within Telegram, you would see a wallet, a non-custodial wallet there that's built on that blockchain. If you search App Store, no one really knows this, but there's an App Store within Telegram, um, which is fascinating. And all those apps are gonna be built on the Ton blockchain itself, right? That's unique. That's, that's not even in Ethereum's realm. And Ethereum stands for something very different, but this is an awesome way to use blockchain to sort of help users understand how to use money, like to move money really quickly. It's sort of the we, WeChat, WePay thesis that Asia understands really well. Yeah, no, I was just, <laughs> sorry. Telegram is awesome. And, and uh, I, I'm a, I mean, I couldn't live without Telegram. And it's amazing to see that the tool we use every day is actually leveraging blockchain technology. Uh, in Dubai, we actually have an application that everybody uses on a daily basis which is actually created by the police, and it's also built on the blockchain. And that's an application that basically has all your kind of personal data, whether it's your fines, your rent, your electricity bill, and it's basically all in your you know, kind of personal digital ID. And um, it's another application that it's, it's built on the blockchain, and people you know, aren't really aware of it, but they're reaping the benefits. So yeah, hopefully we'll see more of that. Completely agree with both of you, like on a PC perspective. Like we do want to see more mainstream adoption of blockchain use cases, um, not limited to people in a Web3 like native ecosystem. Um, so it'd be great to see more exciting use cases coming up next year. Um, and you also touch upon like both um, like different viewpoints in different regions. Um, are there specific regions or markets that you believe will play a significant role? in shaping the VC trends for digital assets in, next, in the next year? Um, yes, I can keep this one brief. I think it's well known by everyone, so not much more to elaborate. I think the US is a laggard on, on regulation and whatever they decide is sort of copied in Europe eventually. But interestingly, Europe has taken a few steps forward here with making it easier to get sort of e-money licenses and VAS, VASPs that allow you to sort of build e-money related things. So that's interesting. We're seeing a lot of fintech, blockchain enabled companies come out of the space as a result of that. Um, personally, I think the most interesting area right now is in the Middle East. And to your point, like they're going big on gaming, which is, which is fascinating. Like, most governments are still worried about how this is gonna impact their financial ecosystem. Meanwhile, the, the Middle East is like, okay, like which blockchain you know, venture-based gaming company can I invest in? So it's really interesting. I think anecdotally speaking as well, a lot of family offices, investors, and friends have moved to the Middle East where they feel safer as even if not, our, some of our portfolio companies don't necessarily feel safe hiring in the US anymore, right? Like it's gotten to that point and they want clarity. So that's how I feel about it, and of course, the emerging markets um, is where the consumer lives. Yeah, I mean, um, I, I guess, I guess, you know, for, for me, like, there's like, specific regions that I'm like fascinated about in terms of like seeing how well adopted like blockchain is, and then there's others where I'm like very surprised that there isn't much awareness, right? So if you look at countries like Korea, which are super well adopted, where you know, like uh, over half the population at least owns a digital asset, right? And then you go to, you know, to other regions where they're massively lagging behind, you can see there's a discrepancy, both in awareness and education. Now, if we talk about the Middle East, I was recently on a panel with um, Yad from Arimoka, and uh, we were talking about uh, Saudi, right? So Saudi Arabia is, um, you know, a, a nation that has a lot of money and is really aggressively investing. So Saudi is basically where Dubai was 15 years ago. Um, religion is having less of an impact, uh, let's say, on restraining business, and they're becoming much more open. And um, the Saudi government actually invested uh, 50 million in Alimoka and, and is giving them a metaverse kind of strategy to actually um, you know, develop this, this, uh, this ecosystem and this kind of understanding of, of what that is. So, yeah, uh, Saudi is very interesting to me, also because it's not far from where we're at. Um, Turkey is also pretty exciting. We were at the, at the Binance Blockchain Summit not long ago, um, three, four weeks ago, and it was awesome to see kind of the adoption. 
a great measurement uh, of, of uh, knowing where we're at is usually talking to, to taxi drivers. <laughs> and we've, we've really realized like Turkey is you know, very well aware of what the blockchain is and what Bitcoin is. So I think, yeah, Turkey is very interesting. Uh, Switzerland, I still, of course, I'm a bit biased because I am from Switzerland. But I think that's an interesting market, and um, France is, is pretty exciting too. We have quite a few investments in the French ecosystem, and um, they're actually one of the let's say they're doing they're doing a, a big job at um, I think they're kind of the America of Europe a little bit because they they are very strict and severe, but they're very active. So actually, the French government really understands blockchain. So, and I think uh, it's it's important because. If there is no regulation, that means the government hasn't done any research on understanding what, what there is to regulate. So, yeah, hopefully governments keep keep educating themselves and uh, the ecosystems will grow, the, you know, bit by bit. And expanding on that, how do you see the role of developing economies in embracing digital assets as a mean for financial inclusion and economic growth? Oh, um... I'll be honest, I don't know the, de you know the GDP decomposition of sort of emerging economies, especially as it relates to tech. I'm going to imagine it's very small. So I wouldn't say it's like vital to, to economic growth per se, but it, EM like definitely has a huge role to play in the blockchain industry. For now, for sure, without a doubt, the best blockchain consumers in the world are the emerging market consumers. Um, Thailand is very special in that way. There's like speculative blood. With, within Thai people, so they've had a big role to play with where blockchain is today and what is enabled by the blockchain. It makes sense. If you if one transaction costs $20, you need to do transactions that are gonna earn you more than $20, so it's all about speculative trading for now. Um, if you, you know, look at all the latest sort of Web3 companies that pop up on, on Twitter and you like go deep in the discords, you will always see a Thai flag. Um, Thai people are early to everything, which is really cool. But I think in the future, in terms of financial inclusion, like yes, this is massive. Like this is a someone with a with a phone can pick up, and you guys know the story. You guys know the story, right? Which is someone with a phone can pick this pick up this uh, this tool and move money globally and do whatever they need to do globally, get a loan globally, or whatever it is. So it's fascinating. I think it's there's a, there's a lot to do there, and I'm I'm banking on the the emerging markets consumer to take this sort of to the next level. Yeah, well, one thing I've noticed which uh, is exciting is that there's been a few funds that have started to um, race specifically for emerging markets. So we have Hashed in Korea, which has Hashed emerging markets. You have Sequoia, which is, uh, has uh, Sequoia India. So really cool to, to be seeing that. On our side, we've actually made our, our first investment in the African continent, which was really exciting with a project called Jambo, was led by Paradigm and uh, a lot of other VCs. And that's kind of been a, a first entry for us to, to just kind of more understand like what the needs are and the opportunities are for financial inclusion, empowerment of you know, digital currency for, for people on the ground. And uh, that project specifically is basically you know, um, building a, a wallet that um, relies on low bandwidth, like internet speed is a big problem in emerging markets. And sometimes applications uh, you know, need, to, need to be able to, to be used and leveraged uh, you know, unlimited resources. So I think, um, yeah, emerging markets are very interesting and hopefully we'll be, uh, you know, deploying more capital into exciting startups coming from these countries. Just one thing to add as well to your point on, on Jambo, we, we did that seed round. Um, so, we, so I went to India last year for Eat India and was blown away. There were kids from 15 years old all the way to 45 at the hackathon and it was that like 2,000 maximum capacity, 4,000 people showed up. It was mind blowing. But I think like other sort of emerging market, emerging market sort of entrepreneurs, they struggle to think on a global scale. And it's not their fault, I think, given the exposure that they have. Whereas the, the, the entrepreneurs coming from Europe and the US really think about, okay, I'm gonna roll this out to the globe, not to my neighbors, you know, a few streets away. And that's, that's, to be very frank, like where we struggle a lot with Asian entrepreneurs. We need them to think globally and understand that this is a global platform and a global competitive landscape. Just wanted to add that. So um, one final question for both of you as we're approaching the end of the panel. Um, so to all, all the entrepreneurs and builders out there, 
Uh, what advice would you give to entrepreneurs building during this time? Where is the money going? Um, which sector do you think are prominent that entrepreneurs should be aware of, like new narratives and trends? And what investment criteria are you guys looking for in projects? All right, so from a founder's perspective, um, what excites me, you know, in terms of the ecosystem is that there is no borders, right? Actually, the majority of uh, projects we've invested in, if we look back uh, the last two years, um, you know, we don't really care where founders are from in that sense. That's not really our criteria, right? So um, our criteria is building a relationship with the, with the founders we back. Um, and of course, you know, we've actually had a lot of founders we backed uh, here in Asia, and um, whether it's Thailand, Vietnam, actually we've deployed quite a lot of capital in Vietnam, and um, yeah, I think um, it's important to just have an open mind from an investor perspective, and in terms of like um, you know the the verticals we've we've been you know active with and are still looking to be active with, of course infrastructure. As you mentioned, is is very important right now. Um, however, we're still believers uh, in, in 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 the gaming ecosystem, um, and we've actually seen an, a large traction from uh, some of our um, you know portfolio companies in gaming that have big user bases uh, in Asia. Uh, Fusionist is one of the recent projects that um, you know is doing insane like on-chain transaction uh, you know numbers. And um, it's big in Japan, uh, it's big in Thai, and also in, in, um, in Vietnam, and generally Southeast Asia. So that's still a trend that we are following, and we have high expectations. Other than that, uh, we have invested in a number of projects in, in, in AI, as well as in the blend between AI and, and blockchain. So one thesis that um, I've recently heard, which, which kind of gets me excited, about where the intersection between AI and, and crypto lies is that if you look five years from now, we'll have lots of tasks that are going to be um, executed by AI agents, right? And if you live in a world where AI is working with AI and there's no human interaction anymore, how is the, how are the AIs going to pay each other? It's gonna be in crypto, be a smart contract. So I think we're leading towards a, a time where, where crypto and block Sorry, where AI and crypto are really coming together. That's very interesting. <laughs> um, okay, so the, the question was sort of advice for builders, uh, trends, and um, what was the last one? Like the narratives that um, builders should be aware of oh, and, right, right. and what investment criteria oh, would criteria. you okay. consider. So, so I'd say um, we'll start on the investment criteria first. With how fast crypto moves, um, the number one criteria for us when we evaluate a founder is, you know, are they agile? Can they pivot if something goes wrong or if the market, if they're offside on their product with the market? It's a very, I'm sure as you guys are well aware, it's, it's, it's often where you wake up and there's another product that has charged ahead of you or enabled a feature that you have. So are you agile enough to pivot around? And it's less so about your qualifications more so about your attitude, more so about your thought process. So that's that's number one. Number two, I would say is um, when it comes to fundraising, like be very, be very pragmatic and be be very prepared. So practice on your own your pitch. Make sure you know exactly what your product is meant to do. Um, you know, find a mentor. Um, really, when you when you're fundraising, we've seen companies do this. They you know they pick up the phone and they call Coinbase Ventures first. Maybe put Coinbase Coinbase Ventures the last and have some practice with smaller investors and see how it goes. Um, another thing I would say as a founder, as he mentioned, um, is you have to be global. You can't build a regional business unless it's very special or regulatorily boxed in. Fine, but you need to be building on a global stage, which is what sort of decentralized technology is about. Um, so that's what I would put as sort of the investment criteria for a founder. On top of that is the usual things like can your, you know, how much how much revenue can your product grow into? Is it, a, is it a blue ocean category? Are you creating a new category? And lastly, most importantly, like what is your moat? In a world where anyone can fork your project, copy your project and rebrand it, what is your moat? So we haven't done any DeFi investments in a while, but one that came very close is one that has you know, half of its architecture on-chain and half of it 
um, enabled by centralized exchanges and off-chain custodians. That can't be forked because they have SLAs with people off-chain and have very unique architecture on-chain that's sort of coupled together, right? That's a good example. Um, so if you can be forked, what is your mode? Is it a network effect? Is it the way you go to the market? Something like that. So that's investment criteria. On trends, I think we covered it really nicely. Like there's a huge AI trend right now. If you don't get it or don't understand it, you don't need to enable, you don't need to enable AI, that's fine. Um, there's a lot more that's exciting, as I mentioned. Consumer, social, identity is huge. You know, how are we gonna enable social on a new decentralized trust platform if we don't have an identity layer? Um, so that's a big one for us. And then we're starting to think about enterprise. We don't really know what the answer is, but we, we think it's more than just buying Bitcoin. Um, and then the third thing was sort of, it was, sorry, criteria, trends, and, advi and advice. What advice which would you give to entrepreneurs? Yeah. So I think I, I think I covered it, right? Um, cool. So um, to add a little bit to both of you, like both are great answers, and I totally agree that teams are one of the things that we look at at KXBC. Um, because through bear market, through bull market, crypto industry moves super fast. So um, as founders, it's important to have the resilience, the perseverance, um, to shift and pivot really fast through different cycles. And especially, we're really interested in, in projects that have real usage and real traction, real use cases, um, that you can sustain um, the project throughout different market cycles. And also, uh, we're particularly interested in infrastructure layers that can sustain and be strategic value add for the bank, since they're the VC arm of uh, Kazakhstan Bank. And we do have like venture builder arms that build in-house products as well. So it'd be great if uh, we both can explore like strategic values um, and founders as well. In terms of the narratives, um, both of you touch upon like the the key trends: um, infra, AI, gaming, social identity. Um, and another one I would add to that is real-world assets. Uh, that's something hyping up in the market trends, and we do see gaps in the assets in the traditional finance space and the crypto space. Uh, that we're looking forward to see more use cases in the real world assets. Um, are there anything else that you guys would like to touch upon? No, I think social side is also interesting. I mean, yeah, if you look at the most well adopted apps in the world, it's social applications, right? Instagram, Facebook, Snapchat, you name it. You know, the, these these applications um, could definitely leverage the centralized technology. So. And, and they would be a great uh, kind of gate uh, to, to kind of like, um, yeah, boost adoption. So that, that's one, one area we've um, invested in in various ways, whether it's like lifestyle, social fi, or early investors in Steppen. Then there's another, uh, you know, AI related kind of behavioral application uh, that is also interesting, which is data labeling. So you open your application, and uh, AI companies have tasks for you and challenges, and you have to kind of, um, you know, just uh, you know, get the job done and, and, and have an interaction. Um, so yeah, th these are applications that uh, are interesting because you, you actually see an application, you can download the application, you have an app store, and then, um, yeah, the, before they launch a token, they launch a product. And I think that's one trend we've noticed is, is, uh, is very important. So, yeah, we're, we're big fans of applications that have a product before they have a token. Uh, I'll add one thing, which is, if you're building anything in insurance, please come talk to me. I'm looking for an ins a good insurance product. It just makes sense. If, if you can insure my wallet from a hack, if you can insure that my money that's deposited in Aave or something is not gonna, you know, I can insure it, like, you can take my money, all of it. I would happily insure. Um, and I would happily pay for that product. Um, and the second thing on the advice on the advice point, right? So we have a portfolio company um, that is building a really cool um, sort of DeFi exchange that's that's quite innovative on Solana. And throughout the entire bear market, other investors were telling them to pivot off of Solana because Solana is dead. Go to Arbitrum, go to Optimism, build where the hype is, and. You know, to my point earlier in the conversation, um, wherever investors are looking and what the consensus is, the opposite is gonna happen, right? So everyone's talking about L2s for like two years, and the first coin to kick off the bull run, obviously, nothing to do with Ethereum, it was Solana. And so they did not take the advice of the other investors, and they kept building in their, in their lane, and they were confident with what they had. So the piece of advice I would have is like, 
yes, like investors, you know, might sound like they know a lot, but you need to back yourself as well. If everyone's looking here, don't be afraid to build here, stick to your vision and, and charge forward. Every time I hear the word Solana, it hurts me because we actually passed on the seed <laughs> like a uh, very, very long time ago. But one thing that um, is a great measurement of, of, um, you know, of Solana, like kind of making it, is that there's just a big developer ecosystem that is just kicking, right? We're exposed a little bit, not, not too much to be honest, but um, yeah, it's great to kind of, uh, as you say, like um, see the, see the you know, like behavior is being different than what the consensus is. So people, many people were not believing in Solana, it's back. Um, we're also big believers in Polygon, and, and, and uh, we're friends with the team, and we, we see what they're doing, and there's different opinions about Polygon. So, um, yeah, I, we always back the underdog, so, yeah. So, um, on final notes for me, I think something that uh, I think would be another interesting piece in the Web3 space is um, something that enables cross-chain interoperability and enhances, um, like, allow builders to build and be flexible in the ecosystem. As you see, so many L1s, L2s are popping up. You mentioned like L2s will get like um, be quite a strong year for L2 uh, next year. Um, so I think something that enhances um, liquidity um, flow across different ecosystems, um, and also. Um, Cross-chain communication, omni-chain, narrative, um, and I think like, stable coin being another thing that would be like a key touch between um, linking traditional finance to crypto as well. Um, any other points that you guys like to add? All right. So um, I think that's a wrap for today's panel. Um, thank you, Ichan and Daniel, for uh, the insights, and we look forward to see crypto and blockchain reaching mass adoption and mainstream. And hopefully next year will be a good year for crypto. Thank you. Ladies and gentlemen, a round of applause for our panelists and our moderator. Thank you very much indeed. Welcome to our